a book I just finished reading by Walter Isaacson that has just blown my mind. And I wondered whether some old guard members, oh yeah, thank you, Mitch, um, uh, might be interested in discussing it. Isaacson is a very facile writer who has written a number of books called his Genius Series on Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Henry Kissinger, and uh, the latest is about Jennifer Doudna. Huh? Who's that? I expect none of you have ever heard of her. Well, last year she won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. The book is entitled The Code Breakers. It's about a 50 year journey that began in the 1970s when another Nobel winner, Paul Berg, discovered how to splice a piece of DNA from one organism into another, producing a hybrid org organism with different properties. It was called recombinant DNA, a term that I've always found very confusing. It led to the biotechnology industry, consisting of three main segments. Agricultural was one of the uh, most active, and you've all seen this, the tomatoes that stay ripe, uh, plants that produce their own insecticides inside the plant. And a, var a, a variety of other things. And this spawned the, the um, concerns about GMO uh, uh, plants. Second, industrial biotechnology, where in one case, plants become producers of useful products. Uh, the biodegradable plastics like polylactic acid, the cotton plants that produce polyester inside, uh, cotton that's blue, so you don't have to have denim without having to dye them. And then also bacteria produced industrial uh, useful products. Um, uh, ethylene, uh, uh, propylene, uh, uh, benzene, butadiene, a lot of uh, uh, products from petrochemicals uh, that can be made renewable. And finally, there's biotech medicine, like synthetic insulin that formerly was made from $8,000 worth of pig or cow bladders, and you needed 23,000 uh, pigs or cow bladders um, for a pound of uh, insulin. It finally climaxed in technology that facilitated the development of the COVID vaccines. It involved something called CRISPRs, which stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So try saying that fast five times. So that's why we use this word CRISPR. Since the 1980s, biochemists noticed repeating sequences in DNA. They didn't know the purpose of any of these repeats. Um, and it's too long and fascinating a story to tell you right now, but let me give you some of the highlights. Bacteria over the eons have evolved with these clustered, repeated DNA sequences known as CRISPRs that can remember and destroy viruses that continually attack them. It's like the uh, uh, micro world's uh, world war gone, gone on forever. But one of the side um, benefits of this technology 
was the prospect to engineer inheritable edits in human DNA that could permanently alter a segment of the human race. And in fact, a young Chinese scientist used CRISPR to edit embryos and remove a gene that produces a receptor for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. This led to the birth of twin girls, the world's first designer babies in 2018. I don't know how many of you even know this. It's akin to Eve eating the apple of the knowledge of good and evil, or Prometheus snatching fire from the gods. So you could use this gene editing to eliminate dreaded diseases like Huntington, sickle cell anemia, or cystic fibrosis. But how about deafness, blindness, being short, skin color, beauty, IQ, and muscles. Whoa, this is mind blowing. And um, there's so many consequences of this uh, technology potential. Will it weaken our feeling of em empathy and acceptance for those less blessed and increase inequality? with access to this uh, technology only for those that can afford the therapy. It's important to know how this is done. Uh, Isaacson calls this the third great revolution in modern times. The first was Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum theory of the atom. The second was the digital revolution based on the bit when some great men such as Al Aho made dramatic uh, contributions. And now a life science revolution based on gene coding. Someday, most of us will have detection devices in our home that will allow us to check for viruses and many other conditions. We will also have wearables with nanopores and molecular transistors that can monitor all our biological functions and they will be networked so that they can share information and create a global bio weather map showing in real time the, reg, the spread of biological threats. Like bacteria, we need a system that can easily be adapted to destroy each new virus. And CRISPR could provide that to us as it does for bacteria. It could also be used someday to fix genetic problems and defeat cancers. Um, although Mike Martin was telling me on the golf course that uh, metastasized cancers in different parts of the body involve completely different genes. So a solution is extremely complicated, but much more, it could enhance our children and allow us to hack evolution so we can steer the future of the human race. The moral and ethical challenges are tremendous. Um, on the other hand, um, we have this God-given ingenuity to do this. It's just like atomic fusion. It could be used for good or evil. Well, I think, and so does Isaacson, that everyone needs to learn about this development, which will shape a future unimaginable to us today.
Uh, I really loved the book. I thought it was, uh, I, I mean, I became aware of it through many sources, but the first one was Bill Tittle and his um, um, announcing of it. So I went out and got it and read it. And I, I mean, two things that particularly struck me of interest that I hopefully we will get to talk about. One is the comparison that he used about halfway through the book of people doing their own thing with CRISPR and comparing that to hackers um, from, you know, 20 years ago on computers and how some of the hacking really helped. And much of it is, you know, a bad thing, but some of it really helped. And so, you know, going off on your own and there's all sorts of ethical and moral concerns that I, I think that, that are just mind boggling as to, I don't know how I feel about them. I can, one day I can listen to somebody and feel real positive that we should do this. And then other days I worry about the future of it. But anyway, the comparison to digital um, hacking uh, really intrigued. Great. Um, and Nolan, um, okay. Um, as my favorite philosopher Clint Eastwood said, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> I never, I never got better than a C in biology. So, so I'm, I'm talking as a student, not, not, not the speaker this time. I want to be the listener. But my reactions as someone who read the book is I was hoping to get, you know, a real thriller or murder mystery. One big aha moment where she says, my God, I've got all the answers and I, and I, I I've solved the problem. And of course, they bang away consistently in a less sexy way that this is how science goes forward, evidently. Not one person making a gigantic individual leap. They emphasize time and time again about slowly progressing, people collaborating, people cooperating, gradually surrounding a problem rather than just um, uh, solving it in some Hollywood way. I, I guess that was that was the one big one of the two big things I walked away with. Of course, the happy thing, and I like being an optimist always, is if they what they have done is change the game. These vaccines were developed in one year or less. And obviously, they're better at doing it now than they were before. So God forbid, if the next COVID-1921 shows up, it sounds like the human race can almost expect, and I may be wrong, that there would be a vaccine that could be developed in a year or less. So those are my two big thoughts. Thanks, Noam. Um, Mr. Varley. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, I enjoyed the book immensely, uh, uh, Bill, uh, but um, one thing I was struck by, I was, I was really fascinated by the scramble for patent rights. Mm -hmm. You got to that about halfway through the book. And so here you are uh, in the midst of this really glorious, pure scientific research, and yet unfortunately human greed kind of comes out as well. So it, uh, to me, it was a little bit of a microcosm of, uh, of what civilization is all about. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Baxter. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, I read the book, enjoyed it very much. I uh, also am an uncle of one of those scientists who uses CRISPR in her uh, job trying to find cures for Huntington's disease. So I could have a nice conversation with her, which was good. And the other thing that I did notice, I'm a big sports guy and sports are very competitive. These uh, scientists are just as competitive. So it was a lot of competition going on, uh, like Steve just said, to get the, uh, uh, the patent made and people that would almost cut each other's throat to, to be first in line. So it was very interesting. And I admired the, the young lady. She was very smart and did a wonderful job. So that is good. So I enjoyed it. Thank you. Hey, Mike Martin. <laughs> OK, can everybody hear me? <clears throat> Just a, a few observations. Uh, I have a pharmaceutical background. <clears throat> I was in research, so maybe I can add something to this uh, in terms of these types of uh, 
of uh, inroads or insights into genetic therapy. Uh, first, uh, pharmaceutical research has migrated from chemistry, which was the hallmark discipline uh, through the 1980s to biology. Uh, secondly, uh, the issue is, is that we should all be aware of, it's the reductionist approach of science to get to smaller and smaller explanations for diseases and the like. Uh, this is almost equivalent to some extent to nuclear fission where you're talking about atoms. This is getting into genes, but recognizing what's going on here in terms of process is important. Now, thirdly, I think Isaacson did a great job in terms of explaining it. Uh, where I felt he felt short, he did not offer any clinical proof where this actually is effective. For example, <clears throat> in the uh, Chinese scientist who altered essentially the AIDS of his uh, in embryos, it was a scientist who was apparently a renegade scientist and he successfully removed the AIDS gene from the offspring of essentially the parents, thereby suggesting that they are immune to AIDS. There's no clinical proof by that I mean, has he gone back and essentially tested that hypothesis, whether they actually essentially were immune to AIDS. It is assumed it's not stated. Ditto, I would say that technologies like this tend to take a long time to reach uh, essentially commercial application. Uh, in, in my tenure, for example, in the pharmaceutical business, monoclonal antibodies, which is really something that's almost <laughs> uh, essentially common today, were discovered in the 1980s. It took a full 20 to 30 years to essentially develop that technology where essentially it's applicable to cancer, uh, essentially other immune diseases such as psoriasis. You'll see on your TV set, when you see a drug that says MAB at the end, that means that it's a monoclonal antibody. Third, I think the other issue is that Isaacson, again, didn't point to any specific evidence that this stuff actually works. And uh, I would say, I believe eventually they'll find a way to have it applicable. But essentially for the time being, I, I looked at, for example, the Moderna website. Not once did Moderna represent that it used CRISPR technology to essentially uh, say that it isolated the virus and essentially the various uh, components of DNA. Moreover, the diagnostic tests that were developed by the Dauda team, quite frankly, were not the diagnostic tests that were used in COVID. They were using essentially, Roche and Abbott used common antibody tests, which have no relationship at all to COVID. So I don't wanna rain on anybody's parade uh, in terms of this Eureka finding but I would say this is going to be a very slow process where essentially the application of this technology will take, not even to speak of the ethical issues, which I'll leave to somebody else, but the clinical issues are very profound. The diseases are very profound and disease is caused by more than genetic mutations. It's caused by a number of things. So I, I'd like to kind of uh, essentially leave it at that. That was plenty, Mike. Um, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Walt Meisner. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, you know, for me, the book was quite long. I thought it was like several books in, into one. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I had heard of CRISPR, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And the explanation was, well, it's the mechanism that the virus uses 
to, you know, they use the mechanism that viruses have to be able to edit uh, DNA. So I knew that all along, but um, so the one big surprise for me was that actually this was like a little turf war going on between bacteria and viruses going back millions of years, you know, refining and honing these methods, which they finally discovered. So that, that was new to me. The other thing is, you know, the book is very light on, on the biochemistry of things. Um, for each thing, they just, um, you know, the author just would give a simple sentence or a couple of sentences of how things worked. And it was enough for me to understand the gist of it, but I would have really liked to have seen a more in-depth discussion of that, accompanied with some pictures. I mean, I could sort of visualize it from the words being used, but I really don't understand what's involved since I don't have a really, I just have highly uh, college chemistry background and not all the biochemistry and you know, uh, cellular mechanisms that go into this. And um, so I would have liked to have seen a better description of that with some accompanying diagrams so I could actually see what it looks like in 3D because he made a lot of uh, emphasis on, you know, one of the problems they had is figure out what these molecules do look like in 3D. So I would have liked to have seen those pictures. Uh, the other thing is the book seemed to be a, you know very big on personalities and how they interact and little you know fiefdoms and who cooperated with who and and you know I mean I guess this happens in the research world but to me um, I thought it was a little bit too much that aspect of it and um, uh, <clears throat> But it did cover quite a range of topics and I did find the book very interesting. So that's all I have to say. Um, I, want, I wanted to just go back to something that uh, Mike said um, about the commercialization and the, and the whole uh, evolution. And there are several points in the book where they talk about equity. And the assumption is, is that because it is costly and you know fiddly in the lab and so forth, that this is going to be something that will uh, be a rich person's opportunity to do quote unquote plastic surgery or designer babies, et cetera, that will not be available to um, younger people or to poor people. Uh, my take on this is, is that this, the cost of this is rapidly going down and uh, we can uh, expect it to go to the point where uh, the equity issues are slimmed down, maybe never eliminated, but certainly slimmed down to the point where, um, you know, just like in our generation, it was a, um, it was kind of a rich pe person's thing to get braces. And now at this point, at least in our society, uh, kind of everybody gets braces, similar stuff like that. But I just wanted to kind of uh, touch on that topic. And also uh, there was one line in there where Jennifer Doudna talked about how, what they're looking at at the future. And she said, agriculture. And I got that one right away. And um, I've been looking a little bit into it. And there are people that are looking into using CRISPR to basically do uh, pesticides and crop enhancements and so forth. So this is taking the whole issue of hybridizing and GMOs to another level. And the key with all this is that it can be very precise and very surgical. And so therefore it, it is not, um, well, to use a gross example, uh, DDT back in the 50s, 60s, they basically just was a, a uh, a sledgehammer uh, uh, on a tool of, uh, of, of eliminating uh, mosquitoes. And this is much more of a surgical scalpel to, to um, tinker with uh, eliminating pests or uh, increasing crop yields and so forth. It's, so to the extent that it's an evolution from our, our prior world of uh, DDT as a sledgehammer. Anyway, my thoughts. And um, uh, Walt, are you, are you back on? Yeah, I did have something else to add. Um, 
you know, there, there are things I, when I read the book, there are things that I thought that he didn't mention because either he didn't know about it or he just sloughed over it. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, I gave a talk for Meg having to do with, uh, you know, why a genetic disease is prevalent in a population, uh, you know, 20% or more when it kills people before the age of puberty, because in theory, the, the disease should die out. And, uh, you know, that disease was sickle cell anemia. And, um, and it turns out this was a genetic defense by, um, by a population group against malaria. So, you know, there was a discussion in it how you can gene edit this and remove the and fix the sickle cell anemia defect, which is actually a single rung in the DNA ladder of a protein. And, um, um, but it sort of opens up the question of, you know, if you fix certain diseases, it may fix it for an individual, but as a population, as a whole, in a specific environment, it could be disastrous, actually. Uh, the other thing uh, that he didn't mention, and I'm not sure if he didn't know about it or not, but people have done um, genome sequencing before they did gene editing and afterwards. And um, they found out that, yes, the CRISPR technique did fix the one gene sequence that they were looking to fix, but it also introduced uh, uh, 1,500 other ones. And since there's a lot of DNA and a lot of so-called junk DNA that's really uh, in the wings, not being expressed, but could be expressed, nobody really knows what kind of effect this has. So I think some of the you know, um, things that they need to fix with the CRISPR process is how to very selectively just do the only gene that they want to edit and not inadvertently create new problems. Um, and there's, you know, there's other things that uh, the author either left out that I thought he could have added or maybe he didn't know about it. So anyway. Okay, uh, next up I see Herb Waddell. Herb? Well, further to those comments about the law of unintended results, <clears throat> science is full of exciting breakthroughs that don't work out because the simple conditions examined in the lab don't come anywhere as near close to uh, duplicating what exists in the body. Um, I learned that Many of you know that I worked at Sloan Kettering. I was handling intellectual property matters for about 500 scientists, give or take, and at the cutting edge of medical science. On the case of Steve Wendell. And uh, one of the first things I learned is antibodies were wonderful for targeting uh, cancers. You could label an antibody with a tag, for example, a radioactive isotope, and it would go to the tumor and light it up so that you could see the tumor and deal with it. Well, early on, I saw a radiograph or a, a, a radiological picture of a rat that had been injected with a labeled antibody. And I asked, well, how come the brain lit up and the certain other organs as well as the tumor? Well, yeah, there are other tissues that react with this antibody. And then one of my first licensing jobs was for the neurologist, head of neurology de department, who studied the diseases um, caused by our own antibodies reacting to a cancer. You get a cancer, you make antibodies. Well, those antibodies also attack your nervous system. And, you know, CRISPR, uh, uh, a virus doesn't care what DNA it inserts its genes in, um, but in a human, you do care what DNA gets uh, genes inserted in. And it may be 
uh, doing it someplace <laughs> where you don't want it done. So there's a, what I'm saying is there's a lot of caution. In my seven years with Sloan Kettering, I learned every year that we had a magic bullet going to cure cancer, Made, maybe three or four of them. But th life isn't that way. They very seldom do what the initial hopes are. And so the same applies to CRISPR. It will do some great things. And I'd like to have it tried first in agriculture and things like that, and very cautiously on humans. And we'll, we'll see what develops. Another thing, Steve made a remark about patents. And as a patent attorney, I've got to defend my profession. Uh, I had to help these 500 scientists get patents on their new inventions, many of which they didn't even realize they'd made. <laughs> but that's another story. And they would resist my attempts to protect the uh, Sloan Kettering's property. They wanted to publish immediately. And I'd say, wait a minute, we gotta have some time to review your work to see if there's any patentable content. And um, that was a continuing battle until a group of two or three inventors got 5% of $5 million uh, as their share of the returns on the intellectual property that we're funding a good deal of research at Sloan Kettering. I mean, they, they, that was, that one invention probably brought in two or three hundred million dollars in royalties and the inventors shared in that. So when the word got out, hey, in those days, a million dollars was a lot of money. So we had a couple of millionaires and the word spread. Hey, you can get rich. So listen to the people who want to protect the property. And, and, and uh, so uh, my uh, experience in the biotechnology field was very humbling. Uh, and uh, thought I'd pass on these thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Herb. And, and you point out one particular issue, well, an issue as a scientist, you know, publishing is what, you know, drives your career. Uh, on the other hand, money talks, right? So uh, one of the issues is the, the disconnect between the pace of, of um, you know, science, the pace of funding, the pace of uh, intellectual property, and, and in particular with CRISPR, where this has been such a um, a fast paced thing as, as opposed to many of the other areas of science which have moved up much more slowly. So it, it, it is a, uh, an issue of, you know, how do we, how do we um, balance the, the, the pace of, of, in your case, patents versus uh, scientific discovery. And, um, and of course that, you know, you got the classic case of the laser, which took what, 20 years in the courts, something like that, long, long time. Anyway, we got other hands. Um, I want to just jump in for a second. Uh, I thought I saw a hand from you, Harvey and Bernice, or, or did you guys just? Okay, no. Then in that case, uh, we're back to Nolan. Okay, <clears throat> uh, an explanation, but not an excuse for Walter Isaacson. This is a book by Walter Isaacson. Walter Isaacson is a historian and a biographer. He became famous by writing a biography of Benjamin Franklin, probably the greatest scientist of his age by far, inventing numerous scientific fields, doing numerous research, not just on electricity, but he does not delve deeply into the science behind Benjamin Franklin, nor did he delve deeply into the science behind a dude called Leonardo da Vinci. You might've heard of him. He wrote a biography of him. So, so when you're talking about a book by Walter Isaacson, if you expect him to get into the weeds with respect to the science, you don't understand whose book you're reading. That's all. You just have to understand it. You're not going to get a deep dive into the science from Walter Isaacson. Um, Mike Martin. Well, 
Nolan, that's an excellent comment. And maybe I've been a little unfair towards them, given uh, the outline of the book and explaining the technology and the like. Uh, I might say I'm looking for it to CRISPR to affect my golf swing, but that will be for another day, I guess. <laughs> but, um, I, 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 but I just wanted to point out I, again here, I, I think this is a very useful discussion. And I think we're all looking for what does this mean? And I did some extensive research on what does this mean? It doesn't mean right now we're going to have cures it's going to be a useful tool as i think tool for scientists as they proceed forward and understand diseases but the record shows if you look at the publicly held companies that are using this technology crispr technologies and editas both one founded by zhang which was the competitor to dauda in this book the other founded by Dauda's assistant, I can't remember the French girl's name. Uh, none of the programs in, in their research bailiwick have proceeded beyond what I would call early stage clinical trials. That doesn't mean they're not gonna work. It just means that the progress in this area is gonna be very slow. Then that, you know, this data obviously is available after Isaacson published his book, so I'm not going to hold him accountable for it. But I thought we'd at least like a perspective as to where this is going and the rate of which it's going. That's the only reason I'm raising these issues. I, I might also point out that within those two companies, CRISPR Technologies and also these are publicly held companies, you can look them up yourself, and Editas. None of these companies have partnered with a pharmaceutical company, which, which usually is an imprimatur that the science has some practical application. Doesn't mean it doesn't have it, but to date, there's been no activity among the major uh, pharmaceutical companies looking at this as a therapeutic window. So it could happen perhaps, but that's what's going on today. That's all I'd like to add. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> Paul Tukey. Paul, you're the guy that's supposed to know how to unmute oh. yourself. Come on. <laughs> I got my mute icon behind my microphone, so I didn't see it. So anyway, I, I, I'd like to welcome Bob Martin to our meeting. He just showed up. We, we caught him in the middle of actually eating his lunch. But um, I, <laughs> I was hoping he would show up because I was hoping he could say a few words uh, uh, in response to the point that Nolan just made a few minutes ago. I, I don't think you heard it, but Nolan was making the point that this book by Isaacson, that Isaacson is not a scientist. He's a, he's a historian and a biographer. And so you shouldn't expect to find any kind of deep dive into the science in this book, as good a book as it might be. And so, and some of the other questions we're talking about really probably have to do with the science. So I think you, Bob, probably could answer some of those questions. Um, I'm not a real so, so I, you know, so welcome. And uh, if anybody wants to, you can ask your question a second time, and Bob might resp respond to it. Okay. Um, you, you want me to speak up? Sure, sure. Say something. Okay. He's the one who gave those couple of lectures on. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, this is Bob Merton. Um, nice to be with you all again. Sorry I was late. My wife is getting bunion surgery. Oh. And uh, we were at the doctor, and of course, it took a little longer than expected. Um, I thought Isaacson did a pretty good job on what I will call the CRISPR fundamentals. Um, I absolutely agree that he is not a science guy, nor that was the intent of the book. Um, my only disappointment on the science that he covered in the book um, is he didn't 
uh, weighed a little bit outside to related discoveries, um, one of which he couldn't because it was quite recent, that are chipping away at CRISPR's frailties. Uh, one just came out from Harvard, um, that got a reasonable amount of press that seems like it might be getting to um, the error problem that was so aptly pointed out. You know, that when CRISPR goes in, it not only changes one thing, it happens to change a bunch of other things as well. Um, there was a second one, uh, CRISPR related, uh, that was associated with epigenetic changes. And uh, what an epigenetic change is, is you have your DNA running along um, and there, uh, one kind of change is the addition of a little tiny group, happens to be called a methyl group, that turns a gene on or off. Um, and a CRISPR-related invention just came up that selectively could turn a gene on and then off or conversely. So, you know, I, you know, I think progress is being made surprisingly rapidly. Um, you, know, you know, right now in gene therapy, as of at least a month ago, there were only nine approved gene therapy drugs. So the field is moving very delicately and slowly as they should. You know, whether it's gonna be a decade or two decades, that's anybody's guess. But, you know, I, I think that's the time frame. Paul, did I want to too? Go ahead, Bob. Was there more? Not, not okay. unless you have okay. a question. Okay, no, 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 we'll move along. Uh, Paul, were you done? We Shall we move along? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move okay, on. Uh, now Harvey and Bernice. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I'm, uh, I have a PhD from Rutgers Medical School in uh, pharmacology, and I uh, did work on uh, RNA virus, uh, not, clearly not coronavirus, they were bullet-shaped, this uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. And I've also worked at Bell Labs in the biophysics department when I had a master's degree. And um, I worked on transfer RNA there, and we looked at and you haven't, that hasn't been mentioned in this book. But I'm very, very interested in CRISPR. I've never done any research on it, but um, I just recently saw that there's a company that's working on uh, perhaps getting rid of having to have, take statins if you have high uh, cholesterol levels and uh, doing a CRISPR transfer. And um, that they're, they're talking about it and, trying to get it patented. I've also been involved in getting patents at companies. I worked also at Corning Incorporated in the biochemistry department. And um, the question of publishing or perishing or getting patents is very interesting because I had a gentleman who worked for me. He got over a dozen patents every year. He brought to the bottom line of the company at least $15 million from his patents. And when he needed to get promotions, there were people in the company that said, oh, he doesn't publish. Well, of course, if you work for a corporation, you're not a university. And it was a big fight to get him promoted. He's, he, he was eventually promoted to the highest level at Corning, but he always brought all this money from his patents to the bottom line of that company. So it's very, very interesting, everything that you've talked about. Um, so, um, I think that this will happen very quickly. When I started looking up pay, pay, patents and papers, I saw that there were over 600 references that I got very, very quickly. So, uh, and the equipment is out there for doing the analysis. I also worked for PE Biosystems when they developed the first high frequency DNA sequencer. I was uh, working there uh, making the polymer that was used inside those machines. 
And those were the machines that were used for the first whole human genome sequence. So um, I'm, as I said, I'm very interested in this and I found some things online because I, want, I did think that the description in the book was not sufficient and I'd be willing to more than happy to send it out to you. I have something that is very, very clear and very short. And by that, I mean maybe seven or eight pages with very, very good diagrams. And it was done by juniors and at Tufts University. And then I have another reference that's about 130 pages that also has good diagrams. So I'd be happy when we go to discuss the chemistry to you know, send you uh, the PDFs and then you can open them and look at them if you're interested. So, um, but I'm very, very interested in this and I'm very glad to talk to people who are interested in talking science. Well, perhaps, perhaps we can uh, put you on the agenda and uh, I'm putting you on the spot right now, but uh, you know, to, to uh, um, you know, not only uh, distribute those things, but perhaps, um, you know, walk us through some of it. Um, you know, as the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, a diagram is, has historically been very, very important. And in this day and age, an animation showing the, the, the things munching and crunching and flipping and displacing uh, would be wonderful. Um, and yeah, and, and of course you can, you can post things to the chat right now or, or get them to uh, Bill and he'll distribute them to the uh, whole group. Uh, anything else, Bernice? And thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to okay. be <laughs> Okay, uh, Steve Varley. Uh, thank you, Mitch. I'm, I, I'm delighted that uh, both uh, Bernice Foyer and Bob Martin are on the line. We have people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, unfortunately, that kind of ruins it for the rest of us who are just here <laughs> winging it. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, just two, two quick comments. Uh, first, uh, Mitch, I'm, I'm not quite as sanguine as you are in terms of the ethical issues. I know you cited braces and the costs for that come down. The one thing I think about, for example, for couples who are having fertility issues is, uh, is IVF. And, and that can be very expensive on the testing and the counseling and the storage and so on. And, and frankly, unless people have extremely good insurance, some insurance policies cover that, uh, it, it's very unlikely that uh, uh, couples in the, uh, let's say, lower uh, two or three quintiles of, uh, of income are, are gonna be able to afford that. And so I'm, I'm still less sanguine about some of the ethical issues here. Um, secondly, uh, to, uh, to, uh, my, uh, <laughs> to my good friend Herb, far be it from me ever to criticize a patent attorney. <clears throat> my concern uh, in talking about the scrambling for patent rights was really more about uh, the, uh, the machinations <clears throat> between Doudna and Zhang, uh, you know, two collaborators previously, but when money was on the table, uh, it, it, it got kind of ugly. That, that was uh, my issue and my concern. Well, hey, I know uh, the spirit in which your comments are made, and I don't take offense at any of them. <laughs> but uh, I would like to say that we have a bunch of chemists, of which I am kind of one, a chemical engineer. And if you're a member of the American Chemical Society, as I have been for almost 70 years now, I guess, um, you get to see any news and they had some good articles on CRISPR and they, they present it to the general chemical educated public in, in terms that we can understand. I'll, I'll dig around and see if, if I can find the reference for that recent, uh, it was I think a special issue featuring CRISPR. Uh, oh. Of course, at my age and stage, it could be on something totally different, like chocolate chip <laughs> cookies. <laughs> I, I doubt it, Herb. <laughs> hey, we're all out for talking about chocolate chip cookies. And Herb, <laughs> I can work with you on uh, downloading. I can, I'm pretty good at downloading uh, stuff off of CNE News. So, uh, oh. you know, if you, if you figure out uh, any 
a issue or whatever page number or whatever i'll i'll work with you on getting the uh electronic version of the of the file uh yeah, let's see is the old-fashioned kind it's just a stack of past issues which i periodically throw out take the bottom foot and throw it away huh yeah okay um uh let's see who's up next um i think i am paul go yeah, I, I have another question for Bob. Um, uh, speaking uh, speaking of references, uh, in, in your first talk to us, Bob, you um, you 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 told us about the uh, companion collection of information, the information you have you have collected and abstracted from all these thousands of papers, and it is itself a significant tome, as I recall, it was about an eight hundred page PDF file. Now I, <laughs> I'm assuming that you've continued to add to that in the ensuing months, and it's more and it's even bigger now. I don't remember you mentioning it in your most recent talk. You did give us a link to it the first time, and would you say that that is? Uh, are we still welcome to look at it? And uh, have you added to it? And does it actually have reference material on CRISPR itself? Um, okay, first. You have to promise not to laugh too much. Um, with the addition <clears throat> of a 15 page synopsis of the whole thing that I just wrote, and my wife nicely uh, is editing, uh, it just passed 2,000 pages. <laughs> okay, uh, you laughed. I told you, you were allowed to. The uh, um, it has 1938 images. Um, it has some stuff on CRISPR and its um, use in COVID, uh, you know, particularly in the testing domain. Um, the two companies that are mentioned in Isis and books uh, and, uh, and some others. Um, I will, uh, Paul, I'll send you a link because I, I moved the document to OneDrive because those people who were so foolish to use Windows were having trouble downloading it from Dropbox. The, uh, uh, another comment, which might have been made already, and if so, you know, pardon me for repeating. Um, Jennifer Doudna's uh, book, on CRISPR is superb. Um, and if people are interested in what I think is a, you know, obviously somewhat self-centric history, but a good history and a, uh, a good explanation, um, complete with some good images, you know, which sadly Isaacson was missing. Uh, I would strongly recommend that. Thank you. Um, Walt Meisner again. Uh, yeah. Um, Bob Martin mentioned ep epigenetics and the book really doesn't touch on it at all. But I, uh, since I took a course in epigenetics, online, um, I just like to explain it to people a little bit. Uh, the DNA is a molecule that's, you know, two amino acids wide plus the rails that they're hanging off of, and it, but it's 15 feet long. And in order to get it into the nucleus of a cell, it needs to be compacted. And the first stage of compaction is there's these molecules called histones, and there's eight of them, and they sort of bunch up together into what looks like an oil drum, and the DNA wraps itself around it like a turn and a half. Now off the histone are tails, and either methyl groups or ethyl groups attach themselves at, I guess, what turns out to be odd number sites, so like 7, 9, 11, 13, things like that. And, and whether a um, a particular genome sequence is expressed, you know, to make a protein or whatever it does, um, is determined by whether these tails are methylated or actually have 
uh, methyl groups on them or not. And, um, and people inherit um, these methyl, you know, these methylations really from their parents. And what it allows it to do is, um, you know, I, I mean, the first question is why is that mechanism there? And the reason that mechanism is there is because it really takes a long time for natural selection to change DNA and for that um, to become effective. However, once a piece of DNA has been added, you know, one, you know, genetic code has been added, it's much easier to turn it on and off according to what the environment demands. So there's a lot of DNA that's really, you know, in the wings waited, waiting to be expressed, um, you know, based on the genetic environment. And there were studies, there's the, um, the study in Sweden that found out that there were, you know, depending whether the grandfather or grandmother, you know, had a good diet or bad diet depended on whether the grandchildren got um, uh, diabetes or heart disease and things like that. And it seemed like a random thing, but people eventually figured out exactly what the process is and how that works. And the other th thing was the nuclear winter in uh, Holland, um, you know, where people starved, it affected the, not the offspring, but the, you know, not, not the children, but the grandchildren of the people that survived that. So there's, there's very deep implications to it. But one of the things is that, uh, like for instance, there's a certain gene that determines the growth of a cell. So, you know, a person inherits a paternal allele and a maternal allele. And so each one controls the methylation of, e of each half. And if it's not turned on at all, then the growths of cells are very slow. If one or the other turns it on, it's sort of medium. But if both of them are turned on, it um, encourages a rapid cell growth, which in some cases can lead to cancer. So uh, a lot of times people have gotten cancers and there's no identifiable gene behind it, but it could be the methylation that controls the growth of a cell that could be, that's responsible for it. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other thing that is, you know, Bob, Martin mentioned that uh, there's some papers out where they can edit the methylation of people's genes. And that's actually very interesting because I re recently read something where they think that aging is due to changes in methylation. So if they can change the methylation back to the way it was when people were younger, it, you know, they would be younger and live longer. So like, this is like a whole new area that people are just starting to, you know, put research into. So I just, you know, want to point, you know, just emphasize the fact that DNA is only half the story. The other half is what are the methyl methylations on the DNA and how is it affected? Okay, I think it's time for uh, Bill Tittle. Yeah. Uh... I was worried uh, getting this discussion going. Now we have 10 minutes left in the, <laughs> I have two pages of questions here. Or we're not going to be able to, to uh, get to today. Um, uh, some of them um, are, are institutional in nature. There's some tremendous questions in my mind about what's the best way to innovate. Uh, and that, that we were discussed in the book that everybody could understand the methylation most of us are a challenge, even though I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer and it's a consultant of the chemical industry. Um, um, so we, we have a limited amount of time and, and I want to, to do a planning for our next activity. Um, uh, specific times, how many people prefer Monday over Thursday? I would prefer Monday. Monday. So if you prefer, Monday, say yes. If you prefer Thursday, say no. So the question is, do you prefer Monday over Thursday? So, okay, I'm seeing three for Monday, four for Thursday, five for Thursday. 
Okay. So Thursday is a little more popular. Okay, so now, you know, I'm not going to go into specifics about who can't actually make it the other time, as opposed to having a preference, but this, this is good to go on for now. Thank you. Okay. So I, I think we're going to try to meet next Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Uh, Bill, in addition to that uh, deep scientific uh, dive, uh, did you have another thought about, let's yes, say, something I had for at us? Least two. I had at least two. One right. was the for institutional aspects of this, you know, how you do research, uh, government, uh, the, the VCs, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, separately, the, all, all the ethical. Um, Great. The many ethical issues. I appreciate um, your patience and your participation. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, uh, we'll learn from this. And you'll be hearing in the future about next steps. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank every. Thank everybody, and Walt, for your especially incisive comments.